It's time for FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. FNPS After Hours. Thanks for joining us for tonight's edition of After Hours. FNPS After Hours. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another FNPS After Hours. I am happy that you're here. Take it away, Mark. Hey, guys. Welcome. I'm Mark Catelli, FNPS president. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this is a National Moth Week recap. As some of you have probably heard here in Florida, many uh, of our nonprofits do raise awareness for our moths. They're important pollinators. Um, but today we have the National Moth Week team. It's a treat for us to have them. Uh, they're all the way from the Northeast. Um, we have Liddy as well as Dr. Elena with us. Uh, if you can both introduce yourself at this time, please. Thank you, Elena. Sure. Hi, I'm Elena Tartaglia, and I uh, am one of the co-founders of National Moth Week. And so Mark had asked us just to do a little bit on our background. So I'm currently working as a botanist, and I uh, earned my PhD a number of years ago now, studying moth ecology and conservation in urban environments and the way that insects, particularly nocturnal lepidoptera, interact with plants in ways that might be different in the urban environment rather than the, well, here in New Jersey, we don't really have rural environments, but in the less urban environment. So it's always been fascinating to me, particularly being from the Northeast, how nature fits in with cities. And um, so that's what I studied for my dissertation. And during that time, uh, Lydia and I met, and I think she'll probably tell you a little bit more about how we got started, but that's when we started National Moth Week. And so since, you know, since my career, I've worked a lot in environmental education and outreach. I um, have been a professor, and now I'm currently a researcher. Hi, everyone. I'm Liti Haramati, sitting in my home in New Jersey. Um, so like Elena mentioned, uh, we started National Moth Week 12 years ago, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm actually, I'm a researcher, but in, uh, in marine science, I work at the Rutgers University, the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences. Um, was always fascinated by bugs and insects and uh, did some research in uh, serving aquatic insects in the south in the, the southern desert in Israel. Um, and a few years ago, quite a few years ago, our local education and conservation nonprofit, the Friends of the East Brunswick Environmental Commission, um, we started to invite people to come out to local parks at night and see what's flying, mostly moths. And uh, this was the idea of my co-founder of the uh, Friends of the Environmental Commission, uh, Dave Moskowitz, who's an entomologist, among other things. And uh, our moth nights were a huge success. We thought we'll have, you know, who, who, a few people, you know, like coming to see what this is all about. We had nights that there were over 100, 150 people, families, you know, people of all ages, and just being fascinated by, by the, the, the flying creatures that, that came to our lights. So Dave and I had a conversation about it, and Dave said, let's have one night and have moth nights all over New Jersey. And I said, why just New Jersey? And he said, okay, let's do it all over the country. And since, since I am, um, I'm an immigrant, I'm originally from Israel, I immediately thought, oh, we should get other countries involved. And I said, let's do it all over the world. And so not knowing anything about organizing events like that, I, you know, I quickly learned how to put up a website and, and use social media to, to advertise this. And in the first year, we had participants from 49 U.S. states and over 30 countries. And, and we've been growing every year. And this year we celebrated the 12-year 
Um, I'll just mention the, the project has two goals. One is, like I said, just bring people out, show them what's in their own backyard, what's in their environment, uh, educate them about, you know, moths are not the things that eat their clothes. They're actually beautiful and ecologically important. And I think Elena is going to talk a little bit more about that. And I believe that if you show people and explain to them, it's not enough just to tell them, you have to show them. And when you show people that how important it is to keep the environment, um, you know, to protect the environment and to have all these creatures living in it, it has a much bigger impact than, than just, you know, standing as a teacher in a classroom and talking about it. Uh, the other goal, of course, is to document uh, moth species, so distribution and diversity. And I say I say this about my you know my day job in marine research and about National Moth Week. Uh, it's a race against time because we're trying to document the natural environment so we can understand changes, but everything is already changing. And so people who participate in the project, we encourage them to take picture and submit their observation to different uh, sites that collect data. And uh, then scientists can go and actually mine all this data and really find good information. That's excellent. I'm, uh, I'm really moved um, that you have successfully created a global initiative without any sort of preliminary or previous background on how to mobilize people across the globe. It really demonstrates A, the power of social media and B, your compulsion to really make this a global affair. Congratulations. I'm, I'm, I, I really have wanted to know that. I know it's in its 12th year, uh, which in itself is remarkable. Uh, it uh, demonstrates endurance and uh, a lasting um, awareness for some very important uh, bugs, lepidopterans. But to have this globally is just astounding. Um, must, you must have put a lot of hours in. Uh, I love a lot hours. of A lot of <laughs> yeah. We all, we all have, especially Lady. Um, I always like to say these are the things that seem like a really great idea late at night after a moth night. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is a good time to add that that we have a whole team. So we started it with a couple other people from New Jersey, but our our team right now is really global. We have and Elena, remind me if I forget anyone. We have people from Hong Kong and Ecuador. And wow. that's just on the on the on the main team, and we have country coordinators from thirty seven countries. Amazing! So really, uh, all all co all continents except for Antarctica. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So right, so it's not just the two of us. We have our core team, um, and and as Lady said, we have people who have volunteered to coordinate events for the week in their own countries, and. I guess it's up to it's up to thirty seven, which is which is incredible. Uh, my last count was twenty five, but I guess we, I, we we increased by a lot this year. We increased by yeah, over, this year over we got a lot of really new yeah. ones. I mean, Bangladesh, I Sri Lanka, England, yeah. Bhutan, Botswana, mm -hmm. and I remember in, back in two thousand twelve me just sitting at my computer in my graduate office, emailing any nature center I could think of being like, hey, do you want to participate in our new event? And people did. So, I mean, I gave talks, but people just, you know, had hosted lots of different iterations of moth nights, whether it was, just a, you know, black lighting or nighttime hikes, or people did, even did moth breakfast for um, if, their, if their patrons didn't want to come late at night, it was an early morning moth, moth bagels and coffee. Excellent. I mean, a remarkable, <laughs> remarkable. It's very moving and uh, motivating. The power of social media and the power of uh, somebody just like just went for it. 
congrats. Um, without further ado, I'd like uh, the viewers to, to actually see some amazing, amazing photographs that have been collected on uh, their group Flickr. And uh, many of us think of moths as being rather dingy or uh, not as flashy as our butter as their butterfly counterparts. But Valerie's going to pull it up on the screen for our viewership to see how remarkably stunning, stunning is truly the word uh, that some of our moths can be. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Elena, if you can. Tell us a, a little bit about moths. Why are they so important as pollinators? And what is their, um, do we understand their true function in the ecosystem? Are we just touching the very surface of it? Because to me, they live, they live mysterious lives. Many of the things that they conduct, we don't, some, some of our moths, we don't even know they're host plants. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like never been studied. Nobody has the funding. People don't have the time. Uh, highly un, uh, understudied and an enormous, enormous uh, bank of species. Uh, tell us a little bit about moths, please, for our viewership. Sure. So, yeah, with uh, as an ecologist myself, you know, I always like to say there's so much that uh, with these natural connections that, like, as, as Mark just said, we've only barely scratched the surface of understanding. Uh, so when I talk about moths, I sort of hit on three main ecosystem functions. So Mark mentioned pollination, and that's a really important function for a lot of the earth, right? So moths don't necessarily pollinate our crops the way bees do, but they pollinate many, many, many varieties of native plants. And it's important Pollination is important because that's how plants reproduce and maintain their genetic diversity. So without uh, moths, we have fewer plants. And moths are sort of can be really long distance pollinators. Some of them can fly up to a, a couple of kilometers in a single night. And so they can disperse pollen really, really far for plants, um, which just increases the amount of genetic diversity available, the, the distinct population. So pollination is a huge one. That's um, part of what I study for my dissertation is sort of my favorite ecosystem function because everybody's helping each other out. So I like that. But moths also play some other sort of more hidden roles such as decomposition. So there's a different suite of moths that break down essentially mostly leaf litter. So decomposition is the cycling of nutrients, right? So when a plant grows in soil, it takes nutrients from the soil, it takes nitrogen, et cetera, from the soil to grow its body, right? And so then those nutrients are in the plant. And so when the leaves die or when the whole plant dies, the only way for those nutrients to cycle back into the soil is via decomposition. And so moths, of course, bacteria, fungi, other insects as well do it, but moths play a role in that suite of decomposers. So we have our soil fertility thanks to moths and other decomp decomposition organisms. In addition, I like to also point out that if we didn't have decomposition, everything that ever died would still be here, which would be unpleasant. <laughs> um, and then moths are essential in food webs. So moths are food, especially caterpillars. So the larva, the, the immature form of a moth is called a caterpillar. And the more we study it, the more we find that Caterpillars, Lepidoptera larva, butterflies and moths are the number one food source for breeding birds. So if you think about it, a moth like larva, a caterpillar is perfect baby food. It's like a soft little squishy sack of protein, perfect for a baby bird. And the number one food fed to nestlings is caterpillars. You'll often see in the spring photos. I, I love seeing like a little tiny, um, has to read with little caterpillars and a, even up to a big raptor with a giant hawk moth <laughs> caterpillar, big hornworm in its mouth. So little caterpillars for little babies and big caterpillars for big babies. So without moths, we would have fewer flowers, we would have less decomposition and we might not have any birds at all. And so they really, everything is so interconnected and moths play a very important role in that. Um, but if I may also add moths, are important to humans and human economies as well. So the process of, here's, here's a vocab word for you, sericulture. Sericulture is the production of 
Does anyone know? Silk. Um, and so silkworms are considered one of the only domesticated insects. And silk production has been going on for thousands of years. It's one of the oldest um, fabrics. Uh, and so moths play an important role. Moth silk is essentially moth spit when a moth, when a caterpillar is ready to uh, pupate to go to the next phase of its life cycle. Certain ones will spin a cocoon of silk. And then you're like, well, then why is silk expensive? You just told me it's bug spit, but it takes thousands of the cocoons. They have to be carefully unrolled to um, create silk fabric. So moths have contributed to human economies for thousands of years. And then more recently, moth cells were used in the production of a COVID-19 vaccine. So all the way up to the present day, I personally, I'm thrilled to get a booster <laughs> that came uh, from a moth cell. So all the way up to the present day, they are still contributing to our economy. So it's not just the ecosystem. You, we can also make a case that we rely on moths for centuries to contribute to our economic well-being. Amazing, Dr. Tartaglia. And some of our viewers are very uh, novice. Uh, they're just uh, learning and discovering about native plants and plant pollinator partnerships. Uh, many of them are butterfly enthusiasts um, and love the aspect of idea of a pollinator garden. Some of them are getting into moon gardens or bat gardens, which I really like uh, because those are really specific to moths. Sure. Especially moths. But uh, for our viewers that are just um, beginning on their journey, what are some fundamental differences between a butterfly and a moth? So I always love this question because I love to tell people that there actually is not an evolutionary difference between these organisms. So when we look at an evolutionary tree, we're not going to get, this is, you know, this is not science class, we're not going to get too into it. There's no place that it branched that these are moths and these are butterflies. It's sort of inter, inter, integrated. Um, so moths are both evolutionarily older and younger than butterflies. Uh, but the first groups of Lepidoptera were moths. So moths are evolutionarily older. Moth species, um, but there's, you know, these are really just these organisms with the scaly wings. That's what Lepidoptera means, that drink nectar and pollinate flowers. Um, but moths actually, in terms of species, first of all, moths outnumber butterflies by about 10 to 1. So there are many, many, many more moths than butterflies in terms of species in the world. And you're like, but I usually see butterflies. Yes, that's because you guys are awake at the same time. Um, except for me, <laughs> a moth researcher. But in the US, there's 11, between 11, 12, 13,000 moth species and just about eight to 900 species of butterfly. Um, so really it, it is like a, a 10 to one ratio. But I understand if you're looking at a bug, you're like, I, I need to know if that's a moth or a butterfly. Perfectly understandable. So a couple things you look for. First easy way to tell is the antenna. So butterflies have club-shaped antennae. So they have a little like bulb, a little swelling on the end of the antennae. So they have these club-shaped antennae. Moth antennae are a little more variable. Some of them are straight. And many um, in many species, the males have these big feathery antennae that look like the bunny ears. So cute. Uh, and that's actually sensors to sense the chemicals uh, that females give off for mating. So if you're looking at the antennae, if you see the feathery ones, that's a moth, more than likely a male. If you see straight antennae, that's a moth. Um, and then if you see the little club tip or the little swelling on the end, that's a butterfly. Uh, butterflies, when they're at rest, have their wings sort of folded upright on the flower, sometimes open. And moths can have the wings folded over one another. Sometimes they're in a little tent shape and sometimes they're rolled up like a little tube and some moths uh, sit flat. Um, and then the vast majority of moths are nocturnal with a few exceptions. There are a few diurnal moths. Diurnal is the opposite of nocturnal. Diurnal means awake in the daytime and all butterflies are diurnal. So if it's awake in the daytime, Likely it's a butterfly, check the antennae. It might be one of our day flying moths, which are incredibly beautiful and fascinating. If it's awake at night, if it's active at night, it's a moth. So I do love that question. 
but the real answer is you don't have to tell the difference because they're not really the, they're not really different. Thank you. Um, so people garden, and uh, of course, they, they think they're just going to attract the bees and the butterflies, and sometimes the wasps because Florida, you know. <laughs> I I love warm. wasps personally. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Um, but you know the 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 moths actually kind of fly under the radar because nighttime, busy lives. They're also, they can be rather reclusive. Uh, they are excellent uh, camouflage specialists as well sometimes. Um, so how does one attract moths in their backyard? Or is that more of a redundant question because they're probably everywhere and we're just not paying close attention? So a couple of things. Um, so again, I'm a Northeastern botanist. But I will say here, I generally advise people, there's a lot of overlap between butterfly plants and then the ones that moths are nectaring on at night. So if you've got a butterfly garden, you probably have a good start. Now, of course, Lepidoptera require both, both host and nectar plants, and those aren't necessarily the same. So it's a matter of taking a look at native plant resources, like, like your local native plant societies are a great resource for this. Um, taking a look at the host plants um, that could host different, if you're interested in particular species of moth, look at the host plants and put those in, right, if, if possible. So we need both host and nectar plants. And then they're a little, so they, they can be highly, highly specific on host plants. So some of them can only eat one, one host they might eat only one species or only one family of plants, but they tend to be, it's a little more general in terms of what they can nectar at. As long as the flower has nectar and it has the right shape that a proboscis can go into and they can find it at night, they're probably going to take nectar from it. So moths tend to like uh, flowers that are light, like white or um, light yellow or light pink, believe it or not, they do use sight, some of them at night to uh, forage for food. But a lot of what they use is floral volatile chemicals, which is a, a big way to say flower smell, right? So ones that are really pungent at night and um, particularly in the Southwest, there's a lot of the cacti that are blooming at night. Those are the kind of things that moths are gonna be nectaring at. Um, and so again, if you're gardening for butterflies, you probably have a lot of your local moth hosts already and maybe add a couple more that are specific to those. And then we really do have to talk about sort of the elephant in the room that pesticides kill bugs. So if you're putting down a lot of pesticides, you're, those are gonna be affecting moths too. And so when I give talks, a lot of it is talking about reducing lawn space. And, you know, I'm not saying you can't have a lawn because, you know, I, I too like to sit in my backyard and enjoy a lemonade. But dedicating some of your land, being a good steward of that land, and dedicating some of it to wildlife. And if, you, if the wildlife you like is butterflies and moths, that's great. Put in some host plants and some nectar plants. So um, additionally, I mean, I guess Florida is a little different. Again, I also tend to go on a tirade about leaf blowing. <laughs> um, so, you know, many species of insects overwinter in leaf litter. And so when we remove that, we're removing habitat, essentially. So I like to also give people permission not to rake your leaves in the fall, too. And I never do, and my grass is actually fine. Um, so putting in some host plants, dedicating some of your backyard space or your outdoor space to host plants. And I'm not saying, you know, you can't have any lawn or you can't sit outside or whatever, but start starting to think about how you fit into the environment and how we can we can preserve and um, be stewards of our local ecology rather than having what I tend to call an outdoor living room. Nothing else, you know, putting, you know, being a steward, putting aside some of that towards your local wildlife. Well, uh, our viewers are listening and they're getting very curious and they have questions for the National Moth Week. Uh, we're going to take the first one from Eric Ruper. Eric is asking our wonderful Dr. Elena and Liddy here, 
what is a good resource for moth host plants? Um, so the, I could, I could put it in the chat um, and I guess then you guys could send it out uh, later on, mm -hmm. but there's a, there's a website, butterflies and moths, that it's like the butterflies and moths of North America website. It's called Vamona. I think it's at butterfliesandmoths.org. So you can look up any, anything by species, or you can turn it around and get a regional checklist of species for your county. And that has, uh, that has host plants listed as well. So that's Excellent. the one that I tend to use and, and I'll, uh, I, I'll put the website in our chat and you guys can send it out to people. Excellent, um, very good. Um, I wanted to touch on, I think you uh, kind of just raised that with the pesticide uh, mentioned that it does affect uh, moth populations among many other insect species, of course. Um, but what are some of the threats, the present threats that are affecting moths in their habitats these days? Yeah, so the number one threat to biodiversity worldwide, whether we're talking about exotic stuff like a tiger or an elephant, or our local, our local wildlife, insects included, the number one threat to wildlife is habitat loss. And in particular for insects, insects need plants. Right. So again, feeding back into we need to set aside more of our uh, more of our natural spaces to be natural spaces and not grass lawns um, that have no diversity. So habitat loss is a major um, major factor affecting all wildlife and insects are no exception. Now, with nocturnal organisms, we also bring in light pollution as a problem. So humans, we don't think of light as pollution. We think of pollution as like chemicals pouring into the water, right? But light is a form of pollution. I like to say darkness is habitat. Darkness is essential habitat for nocturnal organisms, for bats, all of that. And so uh, when we light our spaces at night, we destroy dark habitat. And so a couple of ways that light is a problem, and light is also, I will say light is also a problem for people. You know how you're staring at your phone right before you go to bed and then you can't sleep all night and your doctor says, don't do that? Light is also a problem for people. Right. But biological organisms, whether you're a person or a bug, have circadian rhythms of when you're awake and when you're asleep. And so when we have our streets lit up like daytime, 24 hours a day, then that messes up the sleep-wake rhythms of moths and other nocturnal organisms. Yeah. So light pollution is a major threat. Also, so there's a sort of like diffuse light. So I'm like, I'm in a suburban neighborhood and I'm looking out my window right now. And it's like, it's not quite dark out. It's only 730, but it, it'll be sort of a, diff it never gets pitch black here. I'm in a suburb of New York City. And so there's that diffuse light, but then there's also like point source lights, like any kind of LED street light. And so those pose a, uh, a problem because birds and bats often learn to hunt at those places for insects. And we know if we know something about moths, we know moths are attracted to light. We can get into that in a second if you want to. But when a moth is attracted to a light, like a street light or your porch light, they're gonna fly around in these sort of eccentric circles, not going anywhere. And so that's a problem because it exhausts them, right? It's a tiny body of little insect. It doesn't have huge fat stores to keep it going, right? So they waste their energy and they waste their time. They have these preciously short lives and they waste them. They, they could be foraging and they could be mating, flying around light. And then of course, the ones that aren't LED, LED can get very hot and they can incinerate. Right, and so that that kind of thing then leads to increased predation and broken food webs and all of that, right? So we don't think of light as a problem, but light is a is a major issue. And there, um, if you want a resource on that, I'll I'll put this one in the chat too. But darksky.org is a really good uh, resource for um, talking about the effects of light pollution because dark, you know, dark sky doesn't have to mean dark brown. We can, you know, I'm also a person that sometimes needs to go places at night. 
and I don't have super night vision either. So we can light our neighborhoods in a more environmentally responsible way with timing, with uh, light intensity differences. Um, and in our homes as well, I see a lot of people have porch lights and backyard lights on 24 hours a day. And statistics show that doesn't actually reduce your, um, your uh, susceptibility, it doesn't, does not increase or reduce your susceptibility to crime. So there's no great benefit to having a light on all the time. So really, again, a compromise. We are still part of the earth. We need to fit in, but we can do things to reduce our impact. We can change the intensity of lights. We can time them. We can have motion sensors instead. Um, so habitat loss, light pollution, those are some, some major threats to our poor little insect populations. Got it. Thank you. Let's uh, switch gears uh, just a little bit. Let's talk about National Moth Week, the website itself. Uh, Liddy, uh, if you can, uh, and Valerie, if you can uh, also uh, display their website, uh, that'd be great. Uh, Liddy, if you can touch on um, some of the uh, citizen science activities that uh, pertain to National Moth Week, how people can get involved, uh, Again, you know, the key word here is citizen science. You don't really have to be an expert on moth. You don't have to identify every single species. I uh, was uh, speaking to Dr. Tartaglia and Liddy uh, before this live stream started, and moth can be incredibly hard to identify, but that shouldn't dissuade people like you and me to get out there and discover their hidden world. Um, so, Liddy, uh, take things over. Tell us a little bit about uh, your campaign, your initiative. Uh, going strong in its 12th year. Uh, let's hear about it. Okay, so I'll, I'll just start by saying that citizen science is a, is a relatively new discipline, but it's it became very, very important to the whole world of science because scientists really use the data collected by citizen scientists Every major science conference, I'd say in the last decade, uh, held a session about citizen science. Uh, there's one coming up in November, and it's the American Entomological Society. And uh, Elena is actually going to give a, a presentation about National Moth Week. And the whole session is organized by a graduate student who is our uh, U.S. student representative. Um, so everybody can participate. Um, I will share my screen and show you a few pages of our website. Excellent. Whoops, that's not right. That's not the right screen. Hold on. Um, I'm sorry, I just shared the wrong screen. And this is the right screen. Can you see it? Because I don't. We, we sure can. Oh, it's here. Yeah. Okay, I can see. So um, <laughs> the next National Moth Week starts in 310 days. It's always the last full week of July. Um, and, and like I said, everybody can participate. So we, we separate, uh, separate our uh, events to two kinds, a private event and a public event, and you can see in the map here where the, the pink dots are private events, and I will explain it in a minute, and the blue dots wow. are public events. Um, and, and you can see all the events around the world here. Um, a private event could be just you in your backyard looking at the wall by your porch light and taking pictures of mods. And people, when I say this, people usually dismiss it and say, oh, no, there's, there's nothing there. And I say, well, go out and look. And then they send me pictures. So yeah. moths are everywhere. If there's a light at night, you'll find moths. Uh, a lot of people set up a, um, um, a black light or regular light or a stronger light. Uh, nowadays, you can you can even buy LEDs that have the full spectrum, so they attract insects. Um, so you shine the light somewhere where the the insects can actually rest on. 
Um, you know, people invite their friends for a moth night. I say, you know, mothing is a great activity because you don't have to be active. All you have to do is turn on a light and sit on a chair and wait for them to come. So, you know, snacks and drinks and just have fun. So those would be our private events. Our public events are held everywhere in, in, in parks by local nature organizations, um, youth clubs. We've had uh, events in national parks in the US and in other countries. Uh, some people organize daytime events or they go look for caterpillars. Um, so it's really, I mean, we've had, uh, we have one participant who has been with us since the beginning. Uh, she's in Maine and every year she has, she serves her friends a moth breakfast. No, they don't eat moths, but they come very early in the morning and she has coffee and bagels ready for them. And they just look at what came to the light during the night. Um, so it's really, uh, we've had uh, programs at libraries, so I, sky's the limit. Just think of anything that's moth related and that, that can be your um, your event, especially if you're involved with any kind of uh, nature group. Uh, we do ask people to register and since, Let's see if I can still show you the uh, registration. Yeah, so the 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 form is not active now. Uh, I have to update it for 2004. But basically, it's a Google form. Uh, you just type in the information, and um, your event will show up on the map. Uh, the map, by the way, is uh, this year, in the last few years, was made by um, Rutgers University students who are taking uh, GIS classes. Um, so this is another um, collaboration that I'm very happy about. Um, we have some instructions on the website to teach you how to find mods. Uh, and you can see here pictures from different modding events. Um, we have other resources, uh, if I can find them. We have a wonderful coloring book for kids. So this is just someone who heard about National Moth Week and she made up this beautiful uh, coloring book for kids that uh, is free to use. Um, we have a list of um, books. There's some instructional videos, which should be here. Um, so there's a whole series that are, <laughs> Lena's laughing because we just love them, right? I love Carl. <laughs> yeah. So our team member, Carl, who's from North Dakota, who used to be in North Dakota, the only state that didn't participate in the first National Moth Week, made a series of uh, 10 uh, mothing lessons uh, recorded on video and you're welcome to see them there are some other ones um, we have a couple also in Spanish and we're trying to collect more in other languages and now that I mentioned that so I will tell you that our team our main team is uh, mostly people from the US but and this is of course us and Sandy who was there right from the beginning and Jacob, who started with us when he was, I think, 13 or 14, and is now a PhD student in entomology, and our graphic designer from Ecuador, and Roger from Hong Kong. We have a couple of people from India. And I will show you one more page, which is our country coordinators. And we have country coordinators in 37 countries. Um, so these are people who organize local events in their countries and help promote the project, but more importantly, just the interest and the importance of MOZ. So you can see that they're everywhere. Um, all continents except for um, Antarctica. So here is a map of our, um, where our country coordinators come from. 
Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Excellent. I think one of the burning questions is, and I think I know at least the answer or most of the answer, is that the good work that you're doing is 100% volunteer-based. But is there any funding involved or do you guys seek out the funding for some of your initiatives? Can you touch on this? Because it seems to, like a very robust uh, rollout uh, and an effective one uh, that I can only see grow as time goes along. But can you tell us about how you scaled your idea? Um, of course, it is volunteer driven, but any other way? So that's an excellent question. And like you said, the team, the country coordinators, everybody running the project, we are all volunteers. But of course, there's a lot of cost involved, uh, starting from maintaining the website, the mapping. Uh, we do try to help people in some countries with um, organizing events. Uh, we get donations from businesses um and from people so anyone who wishes to donate i will share my screen again uh we we more than appreciate it because really most most of the ex expenses really are comes from our bank accounts um so any donation is welcome the other thing that i should mention is that uh, we have merchandise with our logo and Every year we have t-shirts and, and other merchandise with um, the dates of that year. So I know that there are people who have all the t-shirts from 2012 to, to, to 2023. Uh, we do get a small percentage of every sale and we're very, very thankful to the people who, um, who buy those, the, the t-shirts and the other things. Um, we have, uh, we do have a program for businesses who donate to us where we, you know, we put their logo on the website and uh, we advertise the fact that they, uh, that they uh, donated to us. And um, at some point, sometime when we have more time, because like I said, we're all volunteers with day jobs, uh, mm -hmm. we are hoping to get some, uh, some grants. Um, Excellent. Okay funding agencies. Yeah, we'll, and take a, a, we'll take any money people want to give. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> we'd, be happy to, we'd be happy to uh, raise awareness for that. Yeah. You guys are doing Thank excellent you. work. Excellent work. Uh, for our viewers, uh, you may be wondering as Florida Native Plant Society registered uh, their social media campaign uh, to raise awareness statewide. And we did. Uh, we uh, went ahead and completed the form um, as you know, it was uh, something that was organizational. If you have something that is a private, more intimate style gathering, you can certainly register that as well, as Liddy touched on. Um, but please register. I think uh, National Law Week does an excellent job trying to capture that type of data uh, so that it is measured in different ways moving forward. Um, our viewers are actually timing in again. We have a couple of questions from Corey. Uh, they had mentioned a uh, particular uh, moth species, the Io moth. Uh, I'm sure you have those up in the Northeast as well. And some of our gardeners are very curious about this. Uh-huh, yes. <laughs> Actually, it's a point right there. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's a great question and uh, probably one that you've heard often. If a caterpillar starts using a particular plant species, um, for their larval host, and they uh, and they start munching on and uh, go through their cycles. Um, can can you switch uh, uh, during their uh, cycle? Um, once you know, like not the first in stars, but like the third or fourth. Can you switch to another larval host species plant, or are they at that point kind of imprinted onto a particular plant species as their larval host? Um, so. I have uh, I have raised many caterpillars in my day, and yes, you you can switch them between hosts. Sometimes they don't don't love to though. So sometimes um, 
once sometimes once they get a taste for a specific host, they like to stay on that. So I have a lot of experience raising Luna Moss, which are the big, beautiful mint green ones, like that one. Um, and they can eat a variety of hardwoods. Uh, but if I fed them sweet gum, that was their absolute favorite food. If I started them on cherry or something else, they would switch between whatever. But if I started them on sweet gum, they demand a sweet gum. So they can have individual preferences, just like your pets can. But yeah, theoretically, if there are multiple hosts, they can eat. Uh, they can eat what what you have on hand. But again, sometimes they can be a little stubborn. If you feed them something that's really tasty, they might really <laughs> like that. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. And Corey actually asked a separate question uh, as time went on. Uh, they asked. What advice would you give someone who is going to be researching nighttime pollinating? Anything you wish you knew going in? Um, well, I did develop my coffee addiction at that time. I did. I was not a coffee drinker until then. Um, so you know, I'm happy to talk to you further about this. Uh, you can. You can. Um, exchange emails later if you'd like. Uh, you know, nighttime field work isn't easy. It's hard to get permissions to be, place, be places, like if on private property or even, you know, I worked in parks and I worked on, on the big famous landfill, Fresh Kills Landfill, and that was the hardest place. This pile of garbage was the hardest place to get permission to be. So nighttime field work does come with some additional challenges such as permissions where public places that are open in the day, you have to get special permission to go to at night and just be, being careful. Um, it's, you know, even with, uh, even with lots of coffee, it's at 3 a.m., your body really just wants to sleep um, or mine, mine did. I, I'm not, I'm a person who's a naturally sort of early to bed, early to rise person. Why did I choose moth research? Um, but that just to be careful because you are going to be really tired uh, if, if you stay up that late. And again, making sure you have permission to be where you need to be because you don't want to be getting in trouble because um, you're already a weirdo because you study bugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm happy to talk about nocturnal research. Don't go by yourself. Bring, you know, we always had undergrad field assistance with us um, and, and, and be safe doing it. And also, uh, again, don't overestimate your ability to see in the dark, bring a flashlight, you know, everybody has a flashlight on their phone these days. So that's not a big deal, but make sure you have adequate places to, you know, adequate light and permissions to be places. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Corey, if you're still listening, uh, send us a love note uh, via email, Valerie, is communications at fmps.org, and we'll be happy to connect you with Dr. Tartaglia. Uh, we're actually uh, uh, closing in on our on our live stream here at uh, the appointed hour. So if you have further questions, now is a good time to place them in the chat box, and we'll be happy to take some of them live. Uh, but without further ado, drum roll, please. Uh, Valerie, uh, we would love for you to unveil the new SNPS National Moth Week Collaborative Resource. Um, this is a labor of love. Um, you know, Valerie actually put together some statistics for us uh, from the campaign. Uh, an email was sent out to 4,189 people, and there were 2,388 unique opens for the campaign itself. Um, our membership is 6,000 members strong at this point and growing every month. We're very um, we're very lucky to have a nice, robust Native Plant Society here in Florida. Um, again, and we share the same sentiments as uh, you, Liddy. Uh, most of our work is done by volunteers. Um, and all the good work that we do as far as outreach and advocacy is done on our free time and from the goodness of our hearts. So uh, we strongly emphasize um, with your initiative and your compulsion to uh, raise the bar on education, per se. Uh, so, Valerie, if you can share the screen, that'd be great. Um, 
or I can try to share it on my end as well. And we can uh, peruse through it just to give our viewers a taste of uh, what we have uh, plugged out. Yes, I did. I did show it uh, earlier a bit. Excellent. So. Excellent. Yes. yes I can, uh, can scroll through uh, it again. Let me, yes, let me pull it up online really quickly because I think it's it's definitely worth looking at um, downloadable documents. Ta -da. All right, let me go to the previous screen so our viewers know exactly where to look for it. Okay. So, put it in the garden here it is. with native section. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Valerie. Appreciate you as always. So, uh, viewers, if you are on fnps.org, please go to fnps.org slash resources slash hub and you'll see all our downloadable documents here, stuff with kids here as well. But if you scroll down and go under the gardening for native section, it's that one with the National Moss League logo and if you click on it, it'll pull up into this gorgeous resource for 2023, 2023 sorry. And if we scroll down, we have some uh, common ones that people want to throw rocks at. And then there are some really beautiful ones uh, that people just want to give a big hug mm -hmm. to. Um, but for our viewers, like Corey, they were wondering about laurel host plants or some cool facts about a uh, particular species. They're all listed here. Uh, life cycle has been listed here as well. Um, any sort of good uh, scientific um, niche life cycle knowledge has been preserved here for your enjoyment with some additional references uh, towards the tail end of each species. And towards the end, we have a note section. So in case you guys are thinking about printing it out and uh, kind of logging in their own observations, we have that. Uh, but towards the end, we actually added a small little jewel, and that is the gopher tortoise shell moth. It is uh, unique uh, to the southeast, notably in Florida. And it uh, uses it's a commensal relationship between gopher tortoises and this particular moth. It's a very fascinating read. Uh, when Valerie posted it on LinkedIn, I saw a whole bunch of comments and reactions to it. People didn't even know that such a thing would exist. Uh, it really blew people's minds. So please check this out, fnps.org uh, slash resources slash hub natural monsters. Yep. Very I cool. Hope you guys can... Thank you. Yeah, we enjoyed putting it together for you guys. It's our, it's our way of showing love from, south, from down here. <laughs> Um, we have another question from Kathy Daniel. Uh, Kathy is asking, what should I plan to attract hummingbird moth? Any, uh, any answers to that? Yeah, so that was a, a chapter of my dissertation was uh, dedicated to. So, I, so are we talking about, by hummingbird moth, are we talking about the clear wing uh, mm -hmm. moth? Okay. Um, because when we use common names, or a They're couple different. that people call yeah. right, we, you're, a couple that people call hummingbird moths. But if we're talking about the clear wings, so they are really overlapped entirely with, uh, in terms of nectar plants, whatever the butterflies are eating, it's, those bright tubular shaped flowers are perfect for a hummingbird moth. And then in terms of larval host plants. Um, Again, I don't. I I think I think you guys have the same species that we do. So um, the the the, sw the smallest one, the, the one that looks like a bumblebee, uh, this is the snowberry clearwing. So the other two can eat a variety of species, and putting me on the spot, I, I can't think of them off the top of my head. Um, but there is the one that eats particularly a shrub called snowberry, which is a beautiful native plant. So why not get a few of those shrubs to put in if you really want the larval host plant for those? But being a 
diurnal lepidoptera. Uh, they eat lots of the same stuff that butterflies do. And that's a great question. I love those. Those are some of my absolute favorite species. Um, and I had put in our chat a couple presentations that I gave that are on YouTube that people can, you can share with your followers that people can, um, people can see that outline a lot of the stuff we have just talked about. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just looked it up as well. Apparently, our uh, coral honeysuckle is a larval host plant for uh, clear wing moth. How could I temporal. forget? Because that's one of my absolute favorite, number one recommended native plant that I tell people to plant because it's a larval host plant. It's for butterflies. It's for hummingbirds, Wing. bird hummingbirds, hummingbird moths. So, and it's a fast grower and it's a native honeysuckle and it's beautiful. So that's a, that's a great one. Well, excellent. Uh, any parting words? We're right on the hour. Uh, Dr. Tartaglia? Yeah, thank you so much for having us. I love doing outreach. I love talking to people. And if people have additional questions, you can, you know, you can get in touch with us uh, through our website or through uh, Florida Native Plant Society as well. Um, and you know, I'm happy to hear from I'm happy to hear from people. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a champion for citizen science. I really appreciate it. Uh, Liddy, any parting words? Just uh, thank you for inviting us. It's always good to uh, spread the word to other people who I'm sure will love to participate. And like I said, the next National Wealth Week starts in 310 days. Mm -hmm. The registration will be up on the website at the beginning of January. Uh, check out the website. Contact us. There's a contact page on the website. And uh, we'd love to have more participants from Florida. Yeah, for sure. And then also that your, you know, your backyard can make a difference in insect conservation. And we can often be pretty hopeless about global conservation, but there is like, Planting some native plants in your backyard is a huge thing, a huge step that you can take for local wildlife. Thank you so much, National Moth Week team. I can't thank you enough. It's great to make new friends. Um, we look forward to uh, collaborating with you. It has been a very easy journey. Liddy, <laughs> thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for making it effortless. I really enjoyed this. Uh, and for our viewership, we'll see you next time. Uh, next month for another FNPS After Hours. Thank you.